Behold how good it is and how pleasant when brethren dwell in unity. This week's Torah portion covers numbers 8 1 to 12 16. It begins with divine instructions on how to care for the tabernacle's golden seven branch lampstand, maintaining its everlasting light. It continues with guidelines for consecrating the Levites. At this point in Numbers, it has been exactly a year since the former slaves left Egypt, so they are reminded how they should celebrate the first Passover, including the bringing of the offerings to the tabernacle. The most satisfying images in the portion come from the descriptions of God's presence over the desert encampment, either by cloud or fire, and how to interpret the command signals. Despite the tangible proof of God's protection via cloud and fire, the people begin grumbling and protesting in a manner much heavier than in previous episodes. It started off that the rabble among them nitpicked their diet. Rabble stands for non-Israelites. Remember the encampment held a mixed multitude. But misery enjoys company, and the Israelites forgot the promises to their ancestors and began whining as well. For a year they had been eating mostly manna in the Sinai. Their stomachs vetoed their faith. They wanted meat and vegetables. In Exodus 16, they had complained about a lack of food and accused Moses and Aaron of trying to starve them. But now they took issue with the monotony of their diet, not the quantity. Moses has a very pronounced breakdown and response to the demand for meat, much more so than he did with the episode of the golden calf or the prior complaints about food. Before this, he has led the people through serial breaches in their faith and not grown so depressed and forlorn. But in this case, he cries out to God and tells him that the burden is too heavy for him alone. He asks God to go ahead and let him die rather than him continue on this way. So why now? Why here? As anyone who has carried leadership responsibilities knows, it is the grand sum of the stress-producing events and not any one challenge in isolation that create leadership burnout. I will also note that as a parent, whining is the thing that gets under my skin the quickest. And Moses does feel as if they are his children. He asks God, why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant? The prophet Jeremiah will make similar sounding laments seven centuries later. In response, God does not try and teach Moses any spiritual lesson through continued suffering. The text goes out of its way to acknowledge that Moses was a humble and great leader. God did not expect more from him. Instead, God does two very practical things. First, he redistributes the workload and makes Moses share the burden of leadership. God commands Moses to bring him 70 elders and gather them around the tent of meeting. And an act that seems to foreshadow Pentecost, the Lord came down in a cloud and took some of the spirit that was on Moses and let it rest on the 70 elders so that they too prophesied. Even two elders that did not make it to the tabernacle received the spirit within their own tents. Through the council of Jethro, Moses had already divided out the task of overseeing conflict with the people. What happened here was different. This was an imparting of the Spirit of God onto other leaders. God made meat rain down next. He tells the people, you will not eat it for just one day or two days or five, ten or twenty days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it because you have rejected the Lord. A real case of the be careful what you wish for. When Joshua, Moses' aide at the time, witnessed the elders prophesying, he became jealous. The Bible doesn't explain exactly why, but we can presume he felt defensive of Moses' leadership and worried that prophetic voices may counter that of Moses. But Moses showed his wisdom generated by age and experience by telling Joshua to put aside any worries about competition. Moses said if it was up to him, everyone would be prophets. Interestingly, Joshua will later have his own struggle in establishing himself as the appointed successor of Moses in the eyes of the people and God will once again utilize miracles as a way of displaying his favor. More significant trials are ahead. Battles await, the cloud, the fire, the ark, the miracles, the prophecies, 
all are a means to deliver one important message. They are not alone. God is with them. His presence rests on them. His power will deliver them. To the readers of the New Testament, this tradition or transferring authority continued during the life of Jesus and also after his ascension. As you know, Jesus bestowed power and authority onto his closest followers to drive out demons and heal the sick. And in a gathering at the temple, much like the lineup of 70 elders with Moses, the people received the spirit of the Lord and the ability to prophesy. Like Moses, we have to be humble enough in our own walk of faith to welcome the giftings of others and the sharing of responsibilities. The only thing that could quiet the thankless hearts and protesting spirits was the direct wisdom of God through the select. Shabbat Shalom. Behold how good it is and how pleasant when brethren dwell 